negotiators continue to work. Uh, the gaps are narrowing, uh, and we're continuing to push for an agreement in Doha. Uh, there's still difficult work to get there, but I continue to believe uh, it's possible. That was U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on his sixth trip to the Middle East since the October 7th Hamas attack in Israel. Blinken met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as efforts to implement a ceasefire in Gaza crumbles. The United Nations Security Council voted Friday morning to pause the fighting, but the resolution ultimately failed. The U.S. proposed language urging an immediate ceasefire tied to a hostage release. But China and Russia vetoed the resolution. Eleven voted in favor, three voted against, and one abstained. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization warns about a generation in peril as Gaza is on the brink of all-out famine. So it does seem to me to be too little too late for the United States to be pursuing this. It's a little bit concerning hearing the U.S. ambassador say things like, China and Russia vetoed this resolution because they simply didn't want to vote for a resolution that was penned by the United States. I think that's tough talk coming from the country that vetoed the two prior immediate ceasefire resolutions. I will also say that a big criticism from Russia and China directly about this resolution is that the language was overwhelmingly rhetorical. There was no concrete demand or call for the ceasefire, making it non-binding. It just said in the resolution that the Security Council, quote, determines the imperative of an immediate and sustained ceasefire. So they're saying that a ceasefire is imperative, but they are not demanding or calling for a ceasefire as the other two resolutions did. So, you know, the way they framed this, the other countries that voted against, Russia and China included, was basically that the United States is trying to throw a political bone to the people in the U.S. that are upset about the situation in Gaza and that the Americans really never had the intent to have a ceasefire, which I think when we look at the record of the two no votes, which vetoed a ceasefire resolution, indicate that that's exactly where the United States stands. I guess I would push back a little bit just with a question, really. Um, why is it that it would really matter what the language was, even if they were demanding it or urging it? What would be the enforcement mechanism that the U.N. Security Council could use at this point to actually force Israel to stop fighting? There could be a world where if there was a demand or call for a ceasefire and there was not one that the member nations of the United Nations could send peacekeeping troops there. It would allow the United Nations to get involved if the parties don't comply. It's pretty obvious that, you know, the United States, based on how much weapons they're sending to Israel, to me, that they don't want that to be the situation. They want Israel to be able to continue their ground offensive in, in Rafah. They want Israel to continue to control the Gaza Strip, to have the IDF be able to dictate where the United States sends aid. It sounds like the United States is okay with Israel controlling the region and they want Israel to control the region by having this be this kind of non-binding resolution by saying, you know, we determine it imperative. It's not saying we, we demand a ceasefire, we call for a ceasefire. So ultimately the United States could say, well, this resolution didn't make it mandatory. It was just us saying, we have to do this. It's more of a declaration than something that's binding with action, which many other countries of, of the United States or United Nations deem necessary. Also the call for the release of hostages in exchange, you know, when 34 of those hostages are killed, you could also have Israel simply say, you know, we didn't get all of the hostages back. You killed some of them. So this resolution is not moving forward because of how Israel has moved in the past. That's likely in the future. So there needs to be stronger language than something weak and also a resolution that's conditional. Mm, yeah, that, those are all good points. And, you know, it does seem like throughout this whole process, throughout this whole conflict, the U.S. has really been trying to have its cake and eat it, too. They've been sort of rhetorically pushing back at Israel, saying that they need to make sure that they're minimizing civilian casualties, that they need to uh, try to do ground offensives rather than missile strikes. But they're still supplying them, as you pointed out, with weaponry and funding to help them continue their war. Um, and so it, it's it's words not backed up by actions repeatedly from the Biden administration. Administration. And the longer that this goes on, I have to think that this becomes a real political issue for Biden. He already had this problem with the uncommitted campaigns in places like Michigan, Minnesota and Hawaii, um, bringing big numbers against him in the Democratic primary. 
Um, I have to think that, again, the longer this goes on, the more there's sort of this equivocation to try to give some air to both pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian sides of the Democratic Party, that it seems less likely those uncommitted voters are going to come home come November. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there are so many people that see how the Biden administration has handled the situation in Gaza, and even people that think a Biden presidency would be better than a, a Trump presidency for people in America. He's, he's more pro-worker in many cases than Trump has been. There's that draw there. But to see Biden repeatedly, you know, have money being sent over to Israel and circumventing Congress to send money for arms and sending arms directly to Israel, it, it feels like he is responsible for this genocide in part, right? He's not Netanyahu, but he is responsible for sending the weapons that were used to kill so many people, over 30,000 in Gaza. And I think people have a very hard time casting a ballot for someone who has done that. And a lot of people say, well, that means you're you're casting a ballot for Trump, essentially. And I think many people don't see our political system that way. They don't see that, you know, voting for a third party candidate, that not showing up is a, a vote for Donald Trump. And I think that kind of thinking, that kind of voter shame just, you know, reinforces this idea that this is not a party that's interested in representing the people, even when you have time and time again polling show where the country stands on Gaza and the administration going in another direction. And so it feels undemocratic how he's handling it. And to just expect votes to be there because they were there in 2020 has been a huge mistake of the Democratic Party. And Joe Biden, Gaza could very well cost Biden the election. You pointed out as well that he's doing this without congressional approval, which is a great point because we see Speaker Mike Johnson intentionally not bringing forward a uh, defense a defense spending package that would include additional aid to both Ukraine and Israel. The Congress just approved this $1.2 billion spending bill. From my understanding, it doesn't include those uh, that foreign aid in it. It does say that it does not have any aid for uh, the UNRWA because of the suspension over claims that they had members of its group involved in the October 7th attacks. But um, this additional package for foreign aid is, is still lingering. Um, and also just to point out the, a little bit of breaking news that Marjorie Taylor Greene has now filed a motion to vacate the speakership against Mike Johnson because of him pushing this spending bill through. Um, but he's staying firm, it looks like, on not allowing the Israel aid to go through. And, and yet Biden is continuing to push weapons to Israel. Right. It's a huge conflict of interest, especially in light of the moving forward, passing the House, the TikTok ban bill, to be very concerned about foreign intervention and in U.S. media by China. Valid concern that you're worried about other countries interfering in our elections is something that many countries do. The United States has sent millions of dollars to activists in Russia in 2020 in the same election we were worried about foreign intervention. And so it's it's a bit hypocritical, but a, a concern every country has about foreign intervention. But then we have APAC, explicitly a pro-Israel group, uh, buying out politicians, almost every politician that voted for the TikTok ban, after you have circulation of leaked audio of the Anti-Defamation League saying, we have a big TikTok problem, that a lot of the anti-Israel sentiment is coming from media spread on TikTok. It seems very clear that we have foreign intervention uh, from Israel through APAC in our election process over how legislation is made by our elected officials. But for some reason, China is more of a concern. And I think that's a bit hypocritical to just focus on China when this is so deliberate and has affected our politics for many years, but especially right now with the ongoing genocide in Gaza. And so to tie together aid to Israel and aid to Ukraine is ridiculous when you have the Russians invading Ukraine and Ukraine trying to defend itself. And then in the situation of Israel, you have Israel moving through Gaza and taking land and saying they refuse to give the Palestinians a state post-war. You have opposite situations. To say that the aid for both should come together and we should do it both at once is almost like tacking on Israel when many people sympathize with Ukraine. They say this is a bad situation for the Ukrainian people but many people critical of Israel, tying this legislation together just to get it passed because there's such a pro-Israel agenda in part by APAC's funding 
it feels like our democracy is entirely broken when you look at these spending bills. You're right. The tying of those two together has always bothered me because it seemed like they were intentionally trying to kind of split the baby, right? They wanted to get the uh, pro-Israel Republicans who are skeptical of Ukraine funding to vote for more Ukraine funding while getting the pro-Palestinian contingent of the Democratic Party to vote for it because they also they would uh, accept some funding to Israel if they could get Ukraine funding. Um, it just seemed like a very shady way of them trying to do this coalition building from two factions that really functionally couldn't be more different and who had different reasonings for why they wanted aid to one and not to the other. Um, my position would be bring them both up for a vote and reject both of them, but I doubt that that's going to happen. <laughs> We're going to be back with more rising after this.